Hello, Nasa Koi, Nasa Elite, our Patreon, <laughs> our Patreon subscribers, our fans, our new fans, people watching us for the first time. This is Talk Gnosis, the world's first and only uh, Nasa System podcast and YouTube show. Uh, tonight, we have an extremely exciting guest, uh, our second in a row from Montreal, from the Belle Provence. Uh, we have Alex Coma. But before we get to Alex, we got my co host, Lainey Peterson. Hi, Bishop. How you doing? Pretty good. Pretty good. It's a uh, thousand degrees in Montreal. Uh, we get a lot of letters where people are like, what's the weather like where you are? So I want to address those right now. And it's a thousand degrees. Um, I also don't know when people are watching or listening to this, uh, but uh, we're still in the middle of the pandemic. But fortunately, we're all alive and well, um, except for possibly yeah. Father Tony, who might be a ghost. Um, <laughs> OK, getting into it. Alex Coma, hello. Oh. Um, so happy you could join us. Uh, this is a show I've been wanting to do for a really long time. Uh, I've actually been wanting to have you on as a guest for a really long time. Uh, our show takes periodic hiatuses. This is our new season, season eight. But um, the connections between art and esotericism is, is something I find really fascinating. And, and it's actually something I, I talk about a lot with, with people close to me and with other esotericists. And it's really not something over the course of almost 200 shows that we haven't really dwelled into. So I'm really happy that you're here with us. So Alex, we're going to jump right into it. Um, instead of giving you a bio, your, your bio will be teased out throughout the show. So Alex, what drew you to painting and art and photography and how did you get started? Well, actually I started I guess with the university where I had to apply to and I, I had the chance to have the parents that would just like choose whatever you, you want to do. So I was interested in photography at first. I had done one class in Concordia, at non in the city of Concordia. So I applied to Concordia with the portfolio and took this class and got in. And so I uh, kind of applied to a photography school thinking of more like commercial photography school. It was actually a, an art school, so I kind of got in an art school without knowing it until like the first few classes I was in there. Had like these uh, studio classes and I was more developing the, the concepts than the actual like technical skills in our studio. So I think to answer your question, I've been kind of dragged into this realm, this, this kind of uh, path. That I've been following more and more intuitively, but it started like dragging me like blindly. While now I'm like seeing it clearly and more actively pursuing. So yeah, sorry, I started with photography at first, and then decided to uh, do what I did at my last year of and this was this painting and class.
Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis, the world's first and only Gnosticism podcast and YouTube show. Uh, I'm one of your co-hosts, uh, Deacon Jonathan Stewart. With me, of course, is Bishop Lady Peterson. Hi, hey. Bishop. Hey. Hey. And, hey. Uh, so happy that uh, you can join us, whether you're listening on a podcatcher or on YouTube. Uh, just by listening, just by sharing, just by engaging, you are spreading the light of Gnosis. If you listen to all 200 episodes, you are guaranteed to get a license. Uh, if you don't, just uh, write <laughs> us a letter. Tonight, we have a very exciting guest. I know I say that a lot, but uh, Talk Gnosis has been running for eight years. And for a long time, I've been wanting to you know, get into the connections between art and esotericism and magic and spirituality, because I really see them as intimately connected. So we have our second guest in a row from uh, Montreal, Quebec, the Belle Provence. We have Alex Coma. Hi, Alex. Hey, Alex. Hello. Hi. So, Alex, instead of kind of uh, giving you a bio or talking about your work, we're going to get right into it. And for those that are listening on the podcatcher, the last half of the show, we're going to be looking at some of Alex's paintings. He's going to be talking about them a little bit. So you may want to check out the YouTube show. But hey, if audio is your gig, it's your gig. That'll be the last half. So Alex, we'll jump right into it. What drew you to painting and to art and to photography and just how did you get started? Okay, well, first of all, I, I think I was kind of dragged into this uh, artistic sphere uh, because when I was finishing CJEP, I took a, I actually took a photo class in uh, CJEP because I really like to use a kind of frame reality. Um, so after graduating my mom was like you have to apply to university the deadline is like next week what do you want to do just choose anything you want but choose so i looked at the programs online saw there was a photo program in concordia so i put my my portfolio pictures from a, from a, the cjep where i was studying put it together and went to concordia and applied with my portfolio and got in the first week of a uh, university in my classes, I realized that I was thinking it was more of a kind of a commercial photography class to learn how to use like lighting and like more, more technical. But I realized I was actually in an art school where they would put forward more the concepts than the technical skills. So that kind of, dragged me into this art realm where I later in my last year of university took, took a, a painting elective. And for me, painting was a big revelation because I no, no longer had to rely solely on reality to create art. I didn't have to actually use a, a, a scientific tool to capture fractions of light. I could actually create worlds of my own so they actually changed my um, my way of thinking and of uh, of working and i think yeah i was just following this path organically so yeah it's it's almost like fate or kismet you, you could say you, you sort of stumbled into it and it and it's amazing um so, so the next question, like, how did you get into the esoteric and, and how did you and why did you start exploring esoteric themes in your work? Yeah, th this was also very organic for me because I started even in university, I was really interested, like I would watch so many documentaries, read books on, uh, on science and physics and, and the quantum physics was actually pushing the boundaries of how like our intellect can actually rationalize some concepts like of uh, like photons that are connected kilometers away and that move simultaneously like weird stuff like that and i was like it just brought me to ask deeper and deeper questions about the fabric of reality which led me to i don't know what was the the, the thing that was like oh spirituality is the way but kind of I think it's just asking bigger questions that gave me answers like through books and uh, yeah it was just very organic i don't know um 
I can there's not like a specific answer I think. Right, like you didn't have like have a vision, uh, you didn't have a dream <laughs> where where God came down to you and told you to give these these paintings, but you know, through exploration, through reading, through asking these questions, you you wanted to explore through your art. Yeah, and all my childhood I I kind of knew there was something out there, like there was something other than uh, agnosticism like like my friends were like no you're crazy like there's nothing else like you die you die and and I was always skeptical and, and I, it didn't make sense to me so I kind of knew and I and I had a um, I had a like out of body experience once in in the backseat of a car like and I experienced just myself floating out of the vehicle and just turning around in midair in the forest that was like uh, 200 meters away and just softly going in the earth and just lying there comfortably. That was like way before Concordia. I had these experiences and uh, so I knew like there was something out there that could satisfy my appetite. Yeah. I think you hit on two really important things just there where I think a lot of people watching or listening, we live in a very secular society. I mean, particularly in Canada and in Quebec, but you know, the really throughout the Western world and a lot of our friends and peers and a lot of circumstances, you know, they're atheists or agnostics and, and mm -hmm. they're, they're going to kind of give that sort of feedback. But here's the second point. If you get a, a group of people in a room, and you ask them, have you ever had like a weird experience? Even the atheists and agnostics, I would say the majority of them will say something like, you know, I had a dream and it came true. Or I was thinking about a friend and then that friend called me. Or even deeper stuff like I had an out-of-body experience. Now, some people will follow that like you did. Some people, they push it away. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Alex, do you have a, a process for creating your art? And if so, what is the process? Well, my process, but in the past, just in the past, like three years, because uh, when I graduated, I was doing something completely different than what I'm doing now. When I really tapped in, I feel like my potential as an artist was when I, I linked my spirituality with my art directly. So like I started to do, uh, I bought a tarot deck, mm -hmm. started using it to uh, just for fun, reading about books about it. And and then I was like, okay, Taro, like, what do I need to, what project, and you, you have pictures that you can show at the end, but what is the thing that I have to work on the, that's most important in my life right now? And that will bring the most via, value to people that will receive my art eventually. So, so this was like my first step in mixing spirituality and art. And, and my first project was exactly that. So... The first thing that came out very precisely in my first project was uh, to dig down inside of me. And it was actually pinpointing a specific moment in my life where I had an unresolved trauma. So tarot was kind of the universe or whatever you want to call it, was already guiding me to, to unblock part of my energy body that was uh, the most blocked at first. So I was starting to create art about that, about these processes in this first seven series, seven paintings that I did in my first series. So, and then it just evolved. And now like it's more conscious in the sense that it's not like I'm delving passively and stuff. It's more like actively I use tarot to guide my next, knowing the power of tarot, knowing the power of intuition also, using my dreams also. Um, yeah. But I always, my, all my projects, I, I feel like I have the duty to myself to not be wasting too much time just like uh, doing, because my art takes so much time, like it can take uh, two months for a painting, two to six months sometimes for the big ones. Yeah. So I don't want to be wasting all that time doing a project if it's not meaningful. So I always start with a, a tarot to give some basis. Oh, wow. Yeah. No, I think a lot of people who are watching or listening that who don't create art would be in many ways stunned if you think about committing your life to a six month project that that's mm -hmm. such a such a huge commitment. So it's, so it is um, uh, fascinating and powerful. Yeah. Yeah, you say six months, but six months, my first project was actually almost three years. 
six yeah. months would be just one painting out of the seven. So, yeah, and and that that's a real commitment. So the the tarot is sort yeah. of leading you, so you know, hey, I'm not wasting any time here. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So in general, do, do you see a connection between esoteric magic? mysticism and art like besides like creating esoteric art besides like what you're mm -hmm. doing when you paint like did you see a, a connection between sort of spirituality and the creative impulse yeah and definitely has become more uh, concrete for me like when i think about it as i work in in the more magical sphere like i i see actually the art of creating a painting is is very powerful or paint, creating art is very powerful in the sense that it allows um, all these complex con concepts that you're trying to integrate to materialize in one body of work and then it's as if it it creates some um, it it uh, crystallizes the information in your in your psyche yeah. but i see that the art of creating something consciously is what art is. So for me, like the biggest work of art that you can see is not creating like art, physical art, it's creating your life. So actually every day consciously taking decisions and creating your own life. And then when you die and you look back on your life, your life becomes this very beautiful body of work. So it's more like using your willpower and your uh, your creative energies to become the best version of yourself in some ways. Yeah, I, I think that's a real powerful message for our, our listeners and watchers who are like, I don't paint, I don't dance, I don't write. What can I do to be creative? And I think you just gave them an answer there that their life can be their artwork. Yeah, totally. Um, uh, Bishop Peterson, uh, I, I will I will ramble. I will hog the mic. Uh, I, I will talk everybody's ear off. Do you have anything you want to jump in before we, we move on to the next question? Um, you know, one of the things that I do, one of my other media activities is I'm a theater correspondent for a radio show, weekly radio show here in Chicago that focuses entirely on the arts, fine mm -hmm. arts, theater, um, you know, uh, photography, oh, film, ev everything. And one of the things that we've uh, been making, you know, observing is people don't always value the arts. They, the, the idea is you're supposed to give away your art for free. Um, people mm. don't want to pay you for, for your work or they, you know, they, they, they see it as kind of a fun thing or a hobby. But when the pandemic hit, everybody turned to the arts. Everybody started reading books. Everybody started streaming movies, looking at paintings online and that sort of thing. Um, how do you feel about the way the work of the artist is is valued in larger society? Well, that's a good question. I think, uh, I mean, I, I'm uh, in my in my personal life. I don't. Um, Yeah, for, from what I know in my sphere, people do value art and people do give credit to it. Um, yeah, I think it depends as an artist what you you decide to focus on. For me, I I, I think my art has been valued and the the mm -hmm. in my entourage, the other artists that I have in my entourage have have had their art valued as well. So I don't really see the that impact, but I do agree that. Uh, that the culture is pushed forward anyways in Quebec it is right now like mm -hmm. through like social platforms mm -hmm. they reach a lot more people because people are paying attention to it right now yeah but uh, I don't think it's that a dramatic change anyways for me in my perspective I think there may be a cultural issue too because uh, I'm in New Zealand there's mm -hmm. stuff going on there although something very interesting that I learned today I got a press release from one of the various publicists that I work with and they pointed out that one of our local small but very respected theaters, um, they've been doing streaming performances and their ticket revenue is just over 50% of what it was prior to this. Mm -hmm. So it actually showed that people are willing to step up and to value, you know, at least in this particular case, particular theater, have people have been stepping up and continuing to, to enjoy art even in a highly modified form and, and mm -hmm. at a time of a recession. 
Um, so I just thought that was interesting as well. But I, I was just curious in your perspective. But again, you're in Montreal, so that's a different situation. No, but it's true that yeah, people have uh, really been pushing it. Even uh, like in here, we have the Encan de la Quarantaine, so the the quarantine auction that went on Facebook platform. And like people are bidding, like uh, artworks, small artworks are selling like thousands of dollars really? online on Facebook. And like I sold an artwork there. People are overbidding. Uh, the, and just pe people that are quarantined see the value of having artwork that speak to them in their home environment while usually they're not as often at home. Right. Mm -hmm. And I guess it has an influence also in the other arts, like you mentioned. Uh, dance and theater yeah and uh the bishop laney all the artists who are watching this who don't live in quebec are, are now making plans to move here <laughs> <laughs> to a place for i don't blame value. you don't blame you at all <laughs> yeah uh, no i think it is partly cultural you, you know quebec is is much better for the arts and for people appreciating art and i was surprised you know when i was younger uh, uh my background is in theater uh, I, I am a professional writer. I also used to play music. And I, I would talk to people from the U.S. and some other places. They were always surprised about the amount of public funding, which has been going down in Canada for, for many yeah. years. But they were surprised that there was so much public funding. Uh, yeah. You know, even now, after years of austerity and the cuts, we still have so much more than the U.S. and certain other countries. Um, and it, uh, uh, it it is great. So, you know, anybody out there, if, if you're a painter or dancer or musician, just you know, send me a message, and uh, you know we'll get married, and you can move to Quebec. Um, <laughs> what are you trying to achieve with your art, if anything? Um, well, for me, my art has developed to be a tool to to um, deepen my understanding of the spiritual realm and my own self as a spiritual being. So. That's like on the personal level, but more and more as I grow project from to project, I, I'm starting to see the, the importance of having a message that will actually um, make people realize their powers and kind of if they're not aware of, uh, of what magic is or just to make trigger some questions in the, the viewers. So themselves can start paying attention to that and knowing that they are very powerful beings and they can achieve whatever they want. And yeah, I think I just give an ex kind of an example of of how how I do it so that people can also do it in some ways. Yeah. You know, that's a very Gnostic message in many ways, because in sort of classical Gnosticism, uh, human beings are, are incredibly powerful, but don't realize it. You know, we've been blinded to our potential and we need something, someone forces to, to wake us up to our to our creative mm -hmm. potential. Yeah. So that's that's very interesting. Very Gnostic very message. Um, Alex, a, a question I, I I've really been wanting to get to. Uh, do you ever find symbols or messages in your art that you didn't deliberately put there? So you, you're done creating a piece, you look at it, and you're like, oh, wow, there's it's, it's speaking to me in a completely different way. I didn't mean to put that in there. Well, it's actually like magical. Every project I do, I finish a painting, and then years later, I look back on it, and I understand exactly where I was in my life when I created it. And I understand that this painting led me to, let's say, the next painting I did like six months later. So every painting has a lot more than I can like absorb at the moment I'm creating it. So I always have to look back at it and I understand better like why I was doing it and why I was putting all these symbols in it. And so like it happens all the time and I even pushed this in one of my projects I did uh, for a show in last last September, where I would actually go forward and take imageries that I had specially that had specially come to mind to uh, when I was thinking of a specific project or concept, and I I was wondering why this image, like what this image, what it resonates so deeply in, in me, and I I used a, a duplication of like um of the image on itself and and some weird like elemental 
beings appeared like in the duplication of the of the image that that kind of related to my concept and uh, it was uh, about like a specific mystical lake in guatemala and these very like vegetal like beings appeared in the in the duplication so i used this in this project to to talk about this how we are often more often than not we are vehicles for for some entities to that can speak through our art if we don't like um if we are not present enough or with ourselves we, we can become vehicles for all kinds of stuff mm-hmm. yeah good uh, i i really wanted to get to that question because um it's, it's an experience that i've had through writing where i look back at, at some of my my older writing and i find recurring symbols that, that i didn't mean to put in there uh, the, mm. bishop peterson have you ever encountered that in any of your work um can you repeat the question uh, have you ever can... looked back at at some writing or creating that you've done and and found recurring themes and symbols that you didn't mean to put there that um seem to sort of spring from another place um it hasn't some happened so much with writing, but then I'm I'm not a fiction writer. Mm. But it has happened in situations where I have been encount I've been speaking to somebody. Um, it's happened sometimes in sermon writing. Mm. Uh, so th- so that has happened to a certain degree. Uh, uh, you know, there is always you point out. It, it, Alex points out, you know, if you're not present in your in yourself, yeah, I think that sometimes you can come under some influences, which may or may not be <laughs> what you want to be sharing through whatever your art is or what you're speaking or what you're writing about. Um, uh, but in some cases also, if you are present and also aligned to something, that can actually be incredibly powerful. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. Um, Alex, uh, I'll, I'll lift up the veil for for the fans. We we had some uh, tactical issues before starting tonight, so me and Father Tony and Bishop Laney, we got to uh, chat for a little bit about the state of the world. And folks, <laughs> I don't know when you're watching or listening to this, but at the present, the state of the world, it's not that great. If you're listening to this in the future from now, I suspect it might be worse. Uh, Alex, the world's particularly messed up right now. Uh, do you see a role for art and or the esoteric in addressing this and sort of healing the world? Or, or do you think that they, that they should just exist for their own sake? you know, apart from trying to fix things? Well, I, I think now, like, in the world, uh, we live in, a like, a binary world, and now I think it can act, and it can go both ways. I think all the flaws of how we've been living are coming to the surface, mm-hmm. but all the solutions to how we can live also come to the surface. So I think it's a very, very rich time, and it's very, for me, it's very exciting because I like it's it's so amazing to be living in this time and mm-hmm. see it and uh for sure my my personal art will continue talking about it i don't think um like i told you i think everyone is an artist anyone anyone that decides and takes decisions and is an artist so i think if it can awake people to take more conscious decisions it will be a big thing and everyone will participate in their in this big art piece that we are as a humanity. So as as artists, I think we will, we might gain some um, some import and maybe the spirituality in art will be more popular because people will see their their potential and their and how they are appropriate in these times and give them more attention. That's what I think might happen. And so it will get to other to more people through us artists but is it our specific role i think we are part as we're as part of it as anyone else who's living in this present moment yeah i think that's a uh, 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 again very powerful and a great way to to put it okay so we've 
we have the uh, the sizzle. It's time to get to the to the steak and, and actually take a look at some of your art. So I'm I'm going to summon the the secret. Deacon chief. Jonathan, is that vegan inclusive? <laughs> yes, that's right. Uh, the vegan <laughs> steak <laughs> now sizzling. Uh, I'm going to summon the uh, the secret chief, uh, the unknown god. Uh, the, he who lurks at the threshold, Father Tony, to, to bring up some of your art. And we'll start with the piece called Sublunar Return. So, Father, mm. if you could bring that up on the screen. Uh, bring that up myself. Okay. And uh -huh. uh, again, to, to sort of lift the veil, we didn't pre write questions about the art. So, uh, mm. so we have it up now. Uh, Say you know even sort of talking about art or asking questions about art, I find can be very difficult. It's uh you know it's it's like you know talking about art is like dancing about writing. It's uh yeah. it's, it's they're two different ways of communicating, but we'll do our best. Um, I find this to be an incredibly powerful and moving piece. Um, I am but a poor writer. I was very sad when it sold. I'm sure you were happy when it sold. <laughs> I, um, I would have, I would have loved to have had it, but I didn't want to rob a bank or uh, my local DEF, the corner store. Uh, and I hope you still have prints for sale. So, so this piece is called Sublunar Return, and I think a lot of people who perhaps take a first glance at it. They wouldn't see a spiritual message. They wouldn't realize that this is an esoteric piece of art. So, mm -hmm. if you could talk about the title, some of the inspiration, and 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 how you see this as as a spiritual piece. Yeah, well, so the this piece was actually the last. So my first series that I spoke uh, upon, like in the beginning of the the show, was a two year and a half, almost three year process where I created seven paintings. And it was kind of my initiation in the art world, but also in the magical world, if we can, if I can say that. So it, when I first started using tarot to guide my art. I, so every painting, I would discover a new part of myself, a new like uh, potential in myself, if I can say. And this last painting, Sublunar Return, was actually the last one. And it was the for me, it was the the conclusion of this big chapter in my life, where I, and and so I wanted to make a piece that was a, that was considering everything I had learned in these two years and a half and putting in one piece. So in this series, I was uh, using architecture as a metaphor for the for the body. So this external facade that we put we put on for the world is. Is the same thing as our 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 home, if we can say. And what's inside, and you look in the the rest of the series. What sometimes you can see through windows, different things. Sometimes there's a broken window. It all speaks of of like who I was back then. And this last painting, sub return. Well, the architecture is the only one that is actually a sacred space. It's a cha chapel, if I can say. And the other ones is more like a tiny little house in the big landscape. So for this one, it's a chapel. It's me acknowledging my body as a temple. And um, sublunar return is for me like this return, like doing a full, like the lunar cycle is more like for me, it's the unconsciousness. And the uh, return is is me doing like a full circle circus from bringing something that's unconscious to conscious. Um, and so in this particular piece, the message that, that is predominant is, is uh, for one, there is lots of uh, reflections, like you see the, the chapel reflected in the water. Um, there's a, this very mysterious vibe, which is also how I perceive reality, like in, in even now, but there's also lots of symbols in the, in front of the chapel and in even the, the light, uh, not the light, the, um, the glass windows of the church. And they all talk about how we have uh, basically mind over matter and how we have the power to manifest our reality through, uh, through different, factors and the first one is to become balanced like we spoke earlier to become wholesome 
so that we can actually control the outcome. And But more than that, it also speaks of the ego death. So this part of ourselves that we have to, part of our personality, if I can say that we have to sacrifice to uh, to to reach different levels in spiritual in spirituality and that's what find the left part of the painting it's very tiny maybe you won't see it if you're looking at a small screen but it's a little cemetery and there's a little angel praying and there's a tombstone with my initials on it oh yeah so it's kind of my that? signature in the yeah. painting but also like a statement Alex, if I may interject here, one of the things that I'm finding very interesting is the chapel and the walkway reflecting in, in the lake, as you pointed out. But what's interesting to me is the way the reflection is, it almost looks as if the path, the stairs there and the path and the stairs, it's almost like it's con a continuous thing in into the deep of the water. Mm. And you can see the reflection of the chapel there. And, it's, and, and from looking at it, it's almost like it would be a place where one could submerge and walk into that chapel mm. subconsciously but then arise and go back to the conscious world. And I could, you know, there, I mean, I know that wouldn't actually happen physically because you'd end up floating and having to swim, yeah. but it looks almost as if there is a pathway and another chapel under the water that could be, and then mm -hmm. that it's continuous uh, yeah. going back and forth between each. And I find that fascinating. It's funny that you point that out. That's uh, back in Concordia, one of the first paintings I did in my, my elective class is there a kind of reproduction of one of my favorite paintings, The Isle of the Dead, Island of the Dead, by Arnold Buckland. Mm -hmm. And it's this island that's reachable just by, uh, it's very, it's in the spiritual, not uh, symbolic art movement. And uh, it's a place where you can only access by boat. So you have to kind of float there, in this very mysterious island. And I think subconsciously, like I thought, I'm just thinking of that for the first time. I think subconsciously I've, I've projected this in this painting. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I did in this painting is the water. When I, I created my original, ah. my original image, it was grass. And the last week of painting this painting, I was like, no, it's going to be water. Oh. Last wow. minute. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, and lady, you said, of course, that wouldn't be possible in real life, but by the logic of the painting, that's at 100%. Yes, absolutely yeah, there. It, makes, and it, yeah. it, flow, it, it just so. moves entirely in there. And it's interesting because when you look at the shape of how the, 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 the reflection and the physical staircase come together in kind of this point, you see that also, but the other uh, uh, tilted um, uh, one way uh, in the trees up there as well. You see that, that kind of that... Um, arrow top i guess you would say but the way they move together so there's a parallel there it's very fascinating to me yeah yeah, yeah. No, and there's also on the right the right side i never i never knew why i put this there but i've always been fascinating by the in french we say the lorry de la forêt so like these uh, edges of the forest that mm -hmm. separate like inside the forest from outside mm -hmm. and so i i i left purposely this dark entrance on the right side of the forest it's just like it it's the darkest and the furthest point if you uh, put it with like space is the darkest space like on the top of the painting that you can your eye can reach but this is also pitch black in the real mm -hmm. actual painting so it's like this mystery entrance that that can also bring you somewhere else ah. yeah yeah it's crazy because uh uh We've talked before, Alex, and I've, uh, I've expressed my admiration for this piece, but I never noticed the, the cemetery and the angel and the mm -hmm. entrance to the, the edge of the forest before. Um, so uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's really rewarding to, to come back to this and to uh, learn and see new things. And before we move on, I'll, I'll put on a few asterisks uh, for our viewers. Um, the... I, we have a lot of obviously esotericists who are watching, and I think a lot of people who might have a background in Freemasonry, like their the hairs mm -hmm. on the back of their neck is, is going to be uh, raising up because there's a big metaphor in Freemasonry about architecture, the body, and the self, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that's that. I think that that's an esoteric theme that a lot of people uh, will find fulfilling and also initiation by, by moving through seven stages. 
you know that's mm. big in a lot of a lot of different mm, systems wow. sometimes it's the seven planets sometimes it's seven rays uh but it's uh i think that's something else that the people who might have an esoteric background might be oh wow you know i yeah. in my reading or my work i went through a seven step initiation mm. um before we move on, also, uh, for those who don't know, we, we mentioned uh, uh, Alex brought up the Isle of the Dead, that the symbolist movement of the 1800s uh, and early 20th century, many of them were Gnostics, they were esotericists, mm -hmm. they were magicians, uh, and their paintings reflect that. So I was really happy to hear you bring them up. I, I'm a big fan of that movement. I didn't even and, know that. That's interesting. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, the very, very, very close ties. and. I think for a long time, you know, they were very popular in their day. Then I think they, they sort of had a, a fall in the art world. Uh, mm -hmm. And they were sort of looked down upon until recently, you know, the last decade, people have been coming back to the symbolists, uh, the symbolic movement and, and really embracing them and, and seeing just how, how great they are. So, um, okay, so we'll move on. Uh, uh, Father, if you could bring up Inner Sun. And if you go on my website, the my background for my website is actually my interpretation of the Isle of the Dead. Ah, perfect. And of course, we will sometimes I forget to uh, do the notes, but we will link your website. Uh, so whether you're on YouTube or a podcatcher, uh, the website address mm -hmm. will be right down below, and you'll be able to uh, to check that out. Um, okay. okay, Father Inner Son. Okay, we got it up. Uh, Alex, tell us about this piece. Uh, well, Inner Sun, that was actually the the centerpiece of a bigger um, a project that I did that was very immersive and very, like, in this the space itself in the gallery was meant to talk about contrasts. So in this piece, I had this, uh, this sun, which is the center of our solar system that's that we we've always seen since the <laughs> the planet has been created or has uh, come to existence and it, it's the one that brings these seven realms out of these seven colors like the full spectrum of colors comes from this inner sun and i i in this painting and we see the actual sun but i use the title to to give a deeper meaning to like the interpretation that you can make of it so you see like the seven colors of the rainbow, but also the seven divine spheres of existence that when put together, create this uh, flower of life. And um, around it, there was uh, these 12 zodiacs represented by medicinal plants that were used in the occult sciences to uh, represent virtues of the, the 12 zodiacs. So it was kind of a big metaphor of all of this uh, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a very big piece, really demands to be seen live. And then were the individual parts, did, did, did you sell those individually or was it sold as a piece uh, entirely? Well, that was uh, my f my second solo exhibition. So I was in my start, like in the best of the, of the worlds, I would have them sold all together. But uh, since I'm starting and I need like the funds that I make from these individual pieces sold actually finances my next project. So, mm -hmm. and actually like last week or two weeks ago, I, I sold the last one of the flowers. Oh, wow. So that was also a big step for me to have sold like this whole project or almost, but yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I think you took us through that one uh, extremely well. Uh, Bishop, before we move on, do you have anything on Inner Sun? I have a lot on Inner Sun, but I'm going to, we have, we have to move along. I'm, and I think um, Alex has just explained it beautifully. And I, I just wish I had been able to see it in person, but it's quite magnificent. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Keto, K Keto Lotus. Is that right? Keto Lotus? Yeah. Yep. Um, so, okay. And then, Father, we got that up. Okay. Go for it, Alex. <laughs> I love this one. Yeah. So, this was a. So, you saw the seven colors and the other one that were representing the seven spheres. Well, on this series, I, I take them to another level where they are the seven colors of the rainbow, but they're also the seven uh, Hindu like chakra system. 
and so each one what i was trying to to it was more for me a study in this case so i was trying to understand the link between east and west philosophies of energy so how like the 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 middle pillar of the of the tree of life is a can be compared to the chakra system of uh, of the east so i used symbols to and also symbols from the tarot and from the the east and western traditions to kind of put together these archetypes that blend both energies together and so ketu ketu is actually this invisible planet in some it's not in every philosophy from the east but uh, in every uh, yogic tradition but in some of them they ketu would be an invisible planet that's in uh, that's only seen in the astral realm and that's associated with uh, keith kether or to the to the 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 higher chakra so that's where this name comes from and yeah the lotus power is the the lotus flower is the symbol of this chakra which is in the center of this piece floating in space all most of them is in my products i like to make stuff float in space because space for me is a good symbol of empty space and this empty space that travels through all of us and links everything together call it, call it ether but for me it's symbolized as just empty space okay again uh, uh amazing uh to, to go through that with you uh bishop any commentary questions what I, i'm just other to say that i'm deeply fascinated by the use of color yeah. in this mm -hmm. um it, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful set of color. It, I'm, I'm finding that fascinating. Um, what's also interesting is we've got this, this, these light beams. I'm actually looking at it, but you can't see them on screen. But um, the way that we see some swirls, I don't know if they're bands of stardust or, 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 or light, oh. but some of them are extending off the piece. Mm -hmm. They're not continuous, and they're going out beyond the bounds of the, the, the painting. Mm -hmm and where they, where they come back and then they're returning, but we don't actually get to see that curve off that painting. So I'm, I'm finding that to be interesting because now we've got something that is going and then returning, we think, but we can't see it because it's out of the bounds of the space. Yeah, it's funny that you point that out because what happened, you, you know my, my first project with Inner Sun. So yeah. I, took, I took the actual seven spheres to do my next project. So I, I kind of reuse them to uh, to further enhance their message, and in this circular piece, which is like three like circles, three um, circumferences, well, I I actually used sacred geometry mm -hmm. to map out this the the sacred geometry. The dance between the number seven and the number twelve creates this very beautiful geometrical shape. And I, I traced out in this big installation this geometry and with these lines that you're describing. Mm -hmm. So they actually mean something bigger that's not that you pointed out. That's quite interesting. Fascinating. Oh, this is so exciting. I'm loving this. We, <laughs> yeah, hope Alex will come back on the show to show more work, but I hope we can bring some other artists on this show because this is wonderful. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I concur. Uh, now, unfortunately, we do got to move on to the we next do. one, <laughs> which is also also exciting, both sad and exciting. But uh, next we have Path of Recovery. Path of Recovery. Yeah, so this, uh, this was actually my biggest piece in the first series that ended with Sublunar Return, the first piece that we, shown, we showed. Um, Path of Recovery... Like I'm not seeing them on the screen right now, so I'm like re visual, revisiting mentally all the symbols I put in. Um, this was, I say, I think it's the fourth one in the series. So maybe like a year and a half to two years in this series. And it was kind of the a very special one for me because I was healing from some past unresolved traumas. So for me, this was the the remedy that I found. So this whole archetype that you see as a landscape and an inner space is actually the archetype of my healing. So mm -hmm. for me, you see this this center like 
circular couch kind of mm -hmm. that has this smoky like feeling coming out of the the couch well for me it was it was me projecting myself on this couch which is kind of a meditation couch where you kind of follow this you become almost like the smoke that disappears and goes in the landscape through the open doors like there's no more closed doors it's almost all open mm -hmm. and so that's the first one on top the top horizontal line of the inner space you see um saturn return like the, Sat the saturn symbol but upside down uh -huh. which represents saturn in this case represents cycles but in this case it's the end of a cycle the reason why i put it upside down so the end of a cycle of uh, releasing the trapped emotions in this case and the recipe yes meditation i, I pointed it out but mm -hmm. also if you look there's a little bush that's over over the river mm -hmm. there's just one and i traced very like you almost don't see it there's a it's a, shaped as a, a sideways heart uh -huh. so uh -huh. that was and for me like the river represents time time flowing so the the hint was uh, self-love over time is how you heal it's the path to recovery uh -huh. And so, and this one is one of my most symmetrical ones. So I actually took the right side of the landscape and repli duplicated on the left side. So it, it creates this very balanced uh, feeling when you're in front of it. With this also the sun, the sunset or the sunrise. So this moment of transition, again, depicting to the end of a cycle, the sun is coming down or the sun is coming up, it's beginning. So all these symbols in a big like mash, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, again, it's. I feel like it's a, a, a deeply moving piece. Uh, a piece that you know, even people who are casual consumers of art would would find uh, quite moving, uh, even if they don't know why. And th this is why I, I really love this work. Is it's it's deeply magical. It's deeply occultic. It's deeply esoteric. But unlike some contemporary occult art, uh, it's uh, it's good. <laughs> it speaks on different <laughs> levels. Uh, a lot of occult uh, art I find is uh, a lot of psychedelic colors. It looks like an acid trip. Uh, it has uh, nothing simple... wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with that. <laughs> I do like some psychedelic art, but it's um, the, the symbols are really uh, force fed to you. It's really yeah. in your face. You know, this yeah. is um, you know you put so much in it, but, but I think a lot of people would look at this and, and be moved on a, uh, a, a, on an internal level right there's there's not something being yeah. pushed on to you a funny uh, a funny a fun fact about this painting i was in a, a bar like a, a year ago and then there's this woman that comes to me and she's like are you alex como and i'm like yeah she's like i dreamt of one of your paintings and it was this one she said i dreamt of your painting then i stumbled upon your instagram and saw this painting and it was my dream so someone dreamt of it before seeing it Wow. which is kind of weird yeah well it's not it, it it is kind of weird but maybe not um if i just want to make one comment on alex i don't know that i don't you know i don't know what your intentions were here but what i'm finding interesting is the positioning of the plants in this mm. because um you know it looks like a retreat center we've got the floor and everything and then we look out we see um a, a manicured lawn we see a palm tree but then mm -hmm. as you get further out it gets more wild because of course we're looking out on the mountains and it becomes completely wild but you see here in the corners each one there's a potted plant peeking out oh. at each corner of this painting mm -hmm. um so we've got the contained plants that have been pulled into this space of meditation and healing mm -hmm. and then but then as we look out we see um the plants becoming progressively more wild I, I thought that that was very, that, very that's powerful. That's a very, uh, very good uh, observation that I had never like realized because how I work with my paintings, I actually, so when I use the tarot, usually some of my traveling pictures come up to me and I'm like, oh, this is the one I want to use for this. And this picture that I use for the background is one when I was in Hawaii, I was I had my camera out the window, someone else was driving, and I just took a snapshot without looking inside like the 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 zoom, the the, the viewfinder. I just clicked. 
and I had, uh-huh. and then I looked at my camera. It was just a forest, and then there was just this clearing. At the same time, I clicked, and I saw this river. It was a bit shaky, but I was like, "What is this place like? This is so beautiful. It doesn't seem like it exists." And so I, I and then I never really saw this place except on my camera, and then I used this for the. For this background and the foreground is another space that I have taken and that I completely modified for the for this purpose but it's a good observation that I had never uh, thought of there we go just discovering layers upon layers so unfortunately we're we're at our last painting uh obviously we would love to do Go through every painting you've ever painted, <laughs> every every <laughs> photograph you've ever taken, but we'll end with transcendental recovery. So uh, I'll just give a moment for for Father Tony to bring that up, and we'll talk about transcendental recovery. So go ahead, Alex. Uh, yeah. So this one was also from the same show as Inner Sun. Um, it was another thing that. So this vortex, uh, uh, this torus shape that's in the center of the painting was actually came to me in meditation. I saw this shape and this color. I was like, what is that? And I, I researched it and I described it in like in Google, found out about it, that it's, it was this torus and that actually is this energy field that goes through us, but that is used in many, not, now I know it's used in many, uh, many occult rituals and stuff, but it's also this same energy like pattern that flows through the earth. So it was a, it was about, so in this one, you see like there's a lot of, um, of wind, like it seems like a very windy, like the, all the, the, the vegetation is bent. Um, and it's also a, a, a painting talking about transformation so the transformation of the self through this tourist field that goes through us how you can unblock emotions through this tourist field but other symbols that are in it is the fact that all this foreground is this lava this molten rock that hardened this molten lava that that hardened and became this rock and there's still a bit of vegetation that that came over top of it so it's like the the purification by fire that brings new life so yeah it was a very transformative piece uh, yeah so i think these are and there's a skull also in the foreground uh, that also talks about like the death and renewal Exactly. Yeah, somehow, again, I've stared at this one a lot and missed the skull until you just said it. <laughs> but uh, again, you took us through it so so amazingly. I have nothing to, to add or say or ask. Uh, the Bishop, do you have anything on this? I think this, this, this one stands very much on its own, and all I'm going to do is get overexcited and, and prattle on. So yeah. um, mm-hmm. I thank you, Alex, for guiding us through that. That's another very powerful image. Wonderful use of color. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, so I think that's it. Uh, the, we're going to wrap up. As I said, we will link uh, Alex's uh, website. Uh, Alex, do you have prints of your work for sale, uh, as well as the actual, you know, originals of your of your work, or is it just the originals? Yeah, I have for the first series, so Sublunar Return and Path of Recovery, and the five others in this series. I made two sizes of a limited edition on very high quality paper. So like I have some small ones like this big that are uh, are on sale, uh, limited edition of 20. And I have bigger ones like this, like 17 by 22, I think that are available uh, also in editions of 10. I think there's one or two in the series that are sold out in one of the sizes, but the rest are almost all available. Fantastic. Well, we'll link those up. And uh, I know our audience is... Uh... Is, is would love to get their hands on them. They're probably like me and also extremely broke, but hopefully they can uh, they can <laughs> <laughs> they can reach in and get some shekels. Uh, talk about being extremely broke. Um, 
<laughs> we uh we know you probably are too, especially if you're an occultist or esotericist <laughs> or a Gnostic. <laughs> but uh if if you do want to support the work that we do, spread the light of Gnostic wisdom. We do have a pra- Patreon. It's linked at the end of the show, it's linked below. Uh you can donate uh, as little as one dollar per piece of media that we release per month. Uh I know that this is a particularly troubling time and perhaps things are extra tight. If you want to support the work that we do and you can't do it financially just share the show or if you don't want to share it publicly just email it to somebody you know who would appreciate it and uh, i know that everybody watching and listening uh has loved this artwork as much as we have and you probably have some friends who love art so uh send them the show and they'll get to find out about alex coma so uh that's it from me deacon jonathan stewart signing off bishop laney peterson Take care, everybody. Alex, thank you so much for joining us. Alex, thanks so much. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was a real pleasure to share my my art and to have this opportunity. Thank you. Hope you'll come on again. Thank you.